All right, great to be here. <laughs> it's a nice library uh, setting. So I'm going to speak more from a, a researcher's perspective. So I'm not really uh, very much invested in any publishing uh, projects. So very bit different from, from the uh, previous speaker, who is much more professional and actually building something uh, inspiring and big. I'm sort of uh, just a researcher trying to find his way uh, in the new reality and um, you know, science publishing being disrupted to some extent and the having a lot of uh, new technologies that are available to us. You know, how can we make this work uh, for us in this what I perceive as a transition period to a, a very, very different reality of scientific publishing. So my title is Reforming the Scientific Publishing System, sort of from, from the bottom up, from the uh, uh, grassroots, open access and open evaluation. You might be uh, familiar with this term. This has been around for a very long time, open access. Everyone agrees scientific research should be openly accessible. Um, but this is more of a new idea, open evaluation. Um, and my overall argument is going to be that um, both of these are, are really two sides of the same coin and we need to uh, make both of these a, a reality. So all of this is part of something even bigger, which is open science. And this is a, an incredible buzzword to an almost annoying extent. Um, so let's just at the, the outset, let's uh, briefly Think about what open means. What, what does it? Why is this such a uh, such an important term? Well, open means transparent. It means usable by others. It means efficient communication. It means improved community checking of results. It means better community cognition. So we think better together by sharing more of our process. And ultimately, also means faster scientific. Uh, progress, right? So there's this kind of, it's really a big idea and I think it's fundamentally a very compelling and really a good idea, right? It is a buzzword also, but um, it's it's also really an important idea. And, and this is totally general to the domain in which we want to be more open, right? So for me, um, there are four pillars of open science, open data, open code, open papers, and open reviews. So basically, it's all about improving the information flow in all of these areas. And you know, how could that be bad? It's easy to agree with, of course, actually making science work more openly and establishing all of these new information flows is not trivial at all, right? And it means that our individual workflows will, will change a lot and there's a lot of trade-offs. You know, we can't do all of this at once. We each have to find our own. Um, way of making this work, um, also in the context of our careers and of uh, current incentives, right? So this is going to be another uh, focus of what I want to talk about. So today, um, this is about publishing, so I'm going to talk about open papers and open reviews corresponding to open access and open evaluation. So this is the peer review process, which I think we, we also need to, to open up. So. As scientists, we're usually focused on uh, our scientific work, and this has an unfortunate side effect, which is that when it comes to publishing, we, we can be a little bit sheepish. So we we sort of we have so much to do, um, we don't feel like thinking creatively about how we publish our work or how we organize our our scientific um, communication at the level of publishing. So we just sort of sheepishly follow an industry um, that has been very important for science and has made an important contribution, but that doesn't have exactly um, the, same, the same incentives, right? I mean, this is a for-profit industry and um, the current system has been very good to them. So they have a strong incentive to, to basically keep things the way um, they are. This is the Medical Research Council security software <laughs> <laughs> asserting itself. Um, so because we, we, we're not used to thinking creatively about publishing, 
um, we we tend to follow the the, the publisher's uh, lead, and we become uh, a little bit sheepish. So let's explore this metaphor a, a little bit further. So there are the sheep. Um, the sheep, the sheep has a lot of wool and wants to share its wool, right? So the, the sheep takes the wool and gives it to the publisher. The publisher um, takes the wool, makes the sheep pay page charges. Um, then the, the sheep is cold, says, where's my wool? It needs the wool back. Um, it misses the wool, so the publisher makes this... Um, beautiful sheepskin jacket, which perhaps fits the publisher better than, than the sheep. Um, the sheep pays a subscription fee. And then the, the, the sheep doesn't like how this is working. The sheep wants open access, so the publisher says, OK, um, just pay an open access fee. Um, so this is pretty much how, how things work at the moment. And you know, I mean, I, I don't want to belabor this, but when you think about this from the perspective of a scientist or from the perspective of the taxpayer who's funding all this ultimately, um, it is a bit of a farcical situation, right? And the only reason that this farcical situation can exist is because we're all in, in some way publicly funded and we don't think it's our, our job to question this, right? If we were a private industry, of course, we would never put up with, with this deal. Right? Because it's, it's a terrible deal. So a publication system fundamentally needs to provide two functions, access to papers and evaluation of papers. Right? So this relates to um, citability, to archiving, to making it possible to, to go online and get any paper quickly and easily. And this relates to making sure that the papers are of high quality and that the uh, results that are out there can be trusted. So this relates to administering peer review and providing some kind of evaluative signal. So in the current system, the main evaluative signal is the prestige of the journal that a paper appears in. If it's in nature, you feel, well, it's been evaluated to a very high standard. And uh, that, to some extent, is true within the limitations of the, the current system. The people at Nature Publishing Group are extremely good at what they do. And you know, they get expert reviewers, and the expert reviewers actually you know, try to uh, objectively evaluate uh, the piece of, of science. And this, this is sort of the, the highest bar that we, we currently provide. It's a closed system. It's a very small number of reviewers. They're all anonymous. We don't know who they are. There are lots of limitations to this within this, this paradigm. Um, but it is the, the evaluation that is, that is actually provided. So, but when we rethink how we would like this to work in the context of modern web technology, sort of from scratch, of course, we'd come up with a very different system, right? So the system we're stuck with, we're, we have for historical reasons and because of vested um, interests of these, the, the, this industry that is administering it at the moment. Um, so I think a, an interesting challenge is to, to reinvent how, how this should ideally work with this idea of openness uh, in mind, right? And this leads us to open access, and there's a big movement for open access. But the other side of the coin is open evaluation, the peer review process, um, which we also need to open up to make more transparent, to make more inclusive, so that the most important work can be evaluated not just by three peer reviewers, but by the whole community uh, to some extent, to the extent that it's very important. Of course, not every paper can get that much attention. Um, but there is a lot to be said for, for a more open and inclusive uh, uh, process on this. So the question then is, how can we transition to a reality where, where we're doing these things? So I'm going to talk first about open access and then about open evaluation to the extent that there's uh, time. So open access, there's sort of two um, major versions of it. One is gold, 
which is gold for the publishing industry, and the other is green, which could be summarized as just put it on the web. So gold open access is basically a small change to the way things work now that makes it possible for publishers to make even more money and make us pay twice for their services. Green is a good idea, but we need to guarantee permanent accessibility and citability, and this is, is a bit of a technical uh, challenge. So what we need for open access is digital object identifiers, which make it possible to identify uh, a paper permanently and, and find it on the web and make sure that unlike a blog post, which is uh, fleeting and can change and can disappear, um, there is a definite way of accessing um, a paper and being sure that it's the same version that we're accessing. So a digital object identifier is a, a digital identifier of an object. It's not uh, 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 an identifier of a digital object, but that's sort of a fine point. So this can be used also to identify physical objects, for example, but it's very important um, for identifying digital objects such as, as papers. So how do you get a DOI and permanent archiving? Well, there's the classical journals. There's alternative, the alternative publishing industry, a lot of uh, new companies that are trying to move into this space. They're realizing that everything is changing. So a lot of opportunities there also for new businesses. And um, some, of, some of these provide um, DOIs, either free or for small charges. And then there's preprint service. And I think this is really a very important way um, that costs nothing um, and really makes good use of modern technology for um, solving this problem of permanent archiving and um, uh, digital object identifiers. So open access with DOI through preprint service, you can get that by using any of these preprint service, the most famous one that many of you know, who knows archive, probably everyone, right? Um, in my field also there's BioArchive and SciArchive, so there's the, the, these um, different options springing up for posting preprints, and it's really very easy. You just uh, make a PDF and you uh, upload it and, and you're, you're done, and then you have a, a permanently uh, accessible open access paper. So an important question that comes up a lot is, am I allowed to post preprints? Interestingly, many people in science think they are somehow not allowed to post preprints. So they want to sort of make a career in science and they want to uh, publish in prestige journals and they feel that there's some kind of tension between these two and they, they have to decide either one or the other. But that's not, not true at all. In fact, all major journals, including Nature, Science and most high-impact high field-specific journals, support the posting of preprints. And there are actually benefits for journals too. It minimizes errors in the final published version. And this is a big concern to journals. They, they too are interested in uh, reducing uh, retractions, for example, and making sure that results are of the highest possible uh, quality. And it also, um, preprint posting boosts the early citations of a paper because the field becomes aware of a new paper earlier. And that means that when the the final journal version comes out, people are already building on it, so they're citing it more early on because usually it takes a while till the citations go up. So more of the early citations fall into this two-year window that counts toward the impact factor. So it actually helps journals um, increase their impact factor as well. So the short answer to this is yes, definitely, you are allowed to uh, post preprints and you can uh, still publish in Nature or Science and almost all other journals. If you want to be somewhat cautious about this, I was about to say sheepish and I don't think you have to be because I mean it's also a little bit about questioning the way things are run, right? So I'm, I'm a little bit unhappy with, with this question here. We shouldn't be asking what we are allowed to do to an industry that's got different interests, right? Profit and interest, uh, um, 
basically, but we should be um, reinventing the way that we do things and do things the way that we want to do them. Um, however, if you want to be very cautious, what you can do is you can go to the Sherpa Romeo website at the University of Nottingham, which is a really great website which puts all the difficult to find information about journal policies in, a, uh, uh, in an accessible format. So they've got these uh, four categories, green, blue, yellow, and white. So green is the most permissive um, preprint policy, which means that you can archive a preprint and a postprint or a publisher's ver version PDF. So you can post your preprint when the paper is ready, then go through peer review, and then when it's published in the journal, you take the PDF from the journal and you can also post that. So you have permanent uh, accessibility of the journal version with the journal layout, right? Um, so here there are these different levels. Yellow means you can archive a preprint before the, the paper is refereed. So it's basically before the journal starts making any kind of contribution to it, right? Because they administer the peer review process and in the end they make their beautiful layout, you know, and it's understandable that, you know, once they've um, made the, the layout, they don't want this, this layout to be uh, accessible um, without people paying on their website. Uh, this question of refereeing, pre or post refereeing, is a little bit more um, up, for, up for grabs, I would say. Um, so I think the reality is that if you post an author version, which is the final version from your perspective, um, but not copy edited and not layouted by the journal, um, then in general you're, you're free to post that and uh, that's, that's fine. So that, that's the um, overall uh, summary from my perspective. So you know, if you look at a particular uh, journal here, you see in detail what is allowed and what is not allowed, right? So you can pull, archive a preprint, um, you cannot archive the publisher's version PDF with their layout, for example. That's, that's for, for nature. And you can look that up for any journal that you're, you're interested in. So what are the costs and benefits of preprint posting? And this is from the perspective of a scientist, because we have to think about um, our science, what's good for our science, and what's good for our careers as well. Right? Is this something that you do as a kind of service to the community, is kind of a good thing to do, but actually um, you might not get a tenured position if you, you know, invest too much in that direction. I don't think that's true at all. I think um, actually it's the best possible career move also, especially because the culture is totally changing and you want to be part of leading that rather than um, following it. So what are the costs of preprint posting? Well, one is posting the actual preprint. Um, I'd say that's less than 30 minutes when you do it for the first time. And really, it's just a minute. It's just uploading a PDF, right? But maybe the first time you want to read a little bit about the preprint server and uh, formats and things like that. So maybe it takes 30 minutes the first time. But it really you know, is almost, almost no additional time investment. And the other cost in many people's minds is the risk of getting scooped because you're sharing your work earlier. So you might be afraid that uh, some competitors uh, see your preprint, they read your preprint, and then either um, do the same thing and publish in Nature and scoop you. Or maybe more realistically and more commonly, they're already working on related stuff and it just sort of uh, slightly uh, inspires them or maybe it just pushes them to, to prioritize their project because they know that there's this, this competing project going on in, in your lab um, and then maybe uh, that makes it more, more likely that you lose the precedent. So, so that's a risk and um, you know how big of a risk that is is debatable in particular cases but let's acknowledge that as you know something that we have to take into account. So what are the benefits? Well, one benefit is open access. It's instant and permanent open access, and you have a DOI. So uh, forever, your paper, and you can update it later when you have the final version, um, will be openly accessible to, to anyone, which is not true for a publication in Nature. Right? A paper in Nature 
in a sense, is not really published because it's not publicly available, right? So if you interpret publish naively as to make publicly available, then you know this whole journal system is just dysfunctional because it doesn't make things publicly available. So this is one important benefit. Another benefit is that you can catch errors better when you share your work um, before it comes out in the final version, right? What if there's a big error? If it's just in a preprint, that's not such a big embarrassment, right? So rather have that conversation before it comes out in Nature, and then you don't have to you know, retract a Nature paper. Another benefit is earlier citation, and this is good for, for the journal as well, as I pointed out, but it's also good for you. Your, your paper can be cited as a preprint already, and then it also gets cited more later when it comes out as the, the journal version. And finally, um, to some extent, as we move into this new reality, preprints will also increasingly start to establish precedence of findings because the preprint is something that you know you, you have proof that this was there at this point in time and you know his, historians of science will look back on that record to determine you know what was the definite result at what point in time so thinking about these uh, risks and benefits an important question is what time, at what time should you post the preprint, right? So let's look at those costs and benefits as a function of the time of posting. So here on the um, horizontal axis, I've got the preprint posting time in years, where zero is the time of first submission to a journal, and uh, one would be one year after that, so that might be about the time of a, a journal publication in my field after, you know, on average, after it's been rejected a couple of times, resubmitted, revised five times, and, you know, maybe, maybe it comes out. It could be more than a year but it, uh, or, or less, but maybe on average it's about a year. So first, there's this, this one cost that we discussed that some people are afraid of, which is the risk of being scooped. So how does that change over time? Well, the later you post, the, the smaller the risk of being scooped, of course, right? If you post after your Nature paper comes out, there is no risk of being scooped, right? And there's really no, it's, it's zero, right? So let's imagine that something like this. So none of this is, is uh, data, by the way. This is just sort of the cost-benefit uh, calculus in my head that, you know, that's how I make this decision. You might want to draw these differently and uh, come to your own, own conclusions. So this is the risk of getting scooped. It, you know, one year before first submission, there might be a big risk because you know you're not really ready with your paper, and there's your competitors are maybe close to submission, right? Um, then you know this de decreases. So at the time of submission, it's sort of someone who reads it when you're already submitting it to a journal. That's kind of hard for them to you know benefit a lot and then uh, uh, scoop you. OK, what about early citation benefit? Well, that is higher the earlier you post, right, obviously. The earlier you, you post, the higher this, this benefit. And if you post at the time of journal uh, a citation, the benefit is 0. Similarly, for a uh, preprint uh, uh, prece precedence benefit, if you just post at this point, uh, you have no benefit of being earlier. However, you still do have the, the open access benefit, right? So the open access benefit is just sort of constant. It doesn't matter when you post. You always have the benefit that your paper will be accessible. So if we sum these all up, you know, in my mind, what the outcome is something like this. There is sort of an optimal... At that point, it's really unlikely that you'll get scooped. And you'll have all these other benefits. You can catch some errors immediately, um, and the final version will be better. You can be cited earlier. Um, you can claim the result to some extent, um, and more and more, the more the, the, the culture changes. So that's all I have on, on preprints. I should probably, how, how much time do I have left? OK. Okay, so I'll move through this uh, quickly. 
So this is um, all about making peer review open. And so what, what do I mean by that? I mean a post-publication, uh, open evaluation is post-publication evaluative responses from peers. That could include peer reviews, so written reviews, and peer ratings. And those are explicit judgments in contrast to article metrics like views and downloads, which measure more um, the buzz than sort of reasoned uh, criticism of work. And they can be signed or anonymous. And so, you know, evaluation is really the steering mechanism of science. It steers the, essential, the attention of scientists, the direction of each field, the progress of science, and the public use of scientific results. So designing the collective cognitive process of the scientific community is really what this is all about, right? It's, in my mind, it's a, it's a glamorous challenge rethinking how we do this. So I'm going to move through this quickly and go to the point. So here are some, some arguments. Um, this one is important. Uh, so in pre-publication peer review, the publication is delayed by the peer review, and that's a, a disadvantage. The review process is closed, uh, which compromises the evaluation. It's limited to a small number of chosen reviewers. There's no public scrutiny of the uh, secret peer review um, at all. In post-publication review, the publication is instant, the review process is open and transparent, and the evaluation reflects uh, the field's deepest wisdom, ideally. It's broader and deeper because anyone can contribute to it. So any student who sees the paper posted can respond to it and be part of the peer review uh, process. So all arguments can be heard. And all arguments themselves are public information because the reviews are transparent. So the reviews can also be uh, scrutinized. Right. So the nature of a review in the current system is it's a secret communication to authors and editors. In the future, it'll be an open letter to the community. In the current system, it decides about publication. In the future, it will evaluate published work. The reviewer's motivation in the current system is both selfless, reviewers want to be objective, and selfish in terms of science politics. They might have their own interests. They want to be cited. They don't want theories to contradict them to gain a lot of uh, traction. And the future system is also going to be selfless and selfish, but in a, with better incentives. The selfless motivation will still be scientific objectivity, and the selfish motivation will be looking smart and objective in public. So, you know, since you're your peer review itself is a publication that's forever part of the scientific record. You have the maximum incentive to want to be on the right side of history. So, to speak. so in the current system, a weak argument can make or break a paper. And in the future system, I think an argument will be as powerful as it is compelling because it's forever there and can be discussed. So I edited this. Um, collection of visions for how this might work in detail. And I'm not going to go through this because we don't have time for that. Um, but I want to um, share some summary uh, points of these 18 papers. So we collected 18 visions for how open evaluation might work. So there's a, a, an ebook in Frontiers in Computational Neuroscience where there are 18 papers. And we wrote an editorial summary of, sort of the consensus points of all of these visions. And here are uh, some of the consensus points. The evaluation process will be totally transparent. So um, e every peer review is instantly published. Uh, anyone can define a formula for prioritizing papers, fostering a plurality of evaluative perspectives. For example, reweighting ratings of papers on different scales in different ways. For example, how important is it to you for prioritizing your own reading that the paper be reliable versus original? And how do you want to weight the contributions, the evaluations of different scientists? Do you trust some scientists more than others? You could have your, your private list of uh, the people whose judgment you trust. The system will heavily rely on signed evaluations. Reviews and reviewers are meta-evaluated. And the open evaluation process um, will be perpetually ongoing. So there's no point where it stops. Um, because we understand that the review process can always uh, you know, 
change opinion. It, it could converge initially on a, an incorrect judgment, and then later uh, um, the evaluation might change. And we'll use a formal statistical inference as a key component of the evaluation process, which is also entirely missing at the, at the moment, where it's just sort of uh, three uh, judgments from three secret reviews. So until we have the perfect platform, um, we can post preprints and we can use uh, modern web technology, blogs, and social media to share opinions and peer reviews, which is instant um, open access to create the culture of publishing that we would like to see. And I think this is a, a really fun thing uh, where we're all challenged to find our own way. And there's lots of, lots of ways that we can so subtly subvert the, the way that things are supposed to work at the moment. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Nicola. My last piece is no inspiring sentence, no call for action at the end. Uh, do we have any questions? We have time for one question before the coffee break. So anybody, quick question? Yes? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is part of this, this fascinating question of how do we organize our collective cognition via the web? Right? I mean, really, what we're building is a bigger brain that's our collective judgments about claims in the scientific literature. Right? So I would argue that in the political domain, we're stuck with some you know, haphazard way of exchanging messages, and that isn't working. And in science, similarly. Right? So it's upon us to invent how to do this in a way that distills our collective deepest wisdom, giving greater weight to people who actually know more or who are more careful in their judgment. So we have to, you know, find, this is about merging our intelligences and merging them also with machine intelligence on the web that you know, uh, estimates uh, reputations, for example, takes all those judgments, combines them, does probabilistic inference in this distributed sort of human machine system I think so that's where where all this is going and ultimately I would hope that um, the mechanisms for that will be incredibly powerful and they will uh, also be applicable to the uh, public domain for example for rapidly debunking uh, fake news right at the level of textbook knowledge um, the web is working very well Wikipedia for example is quite reliable on a lot of things right um, on textbook knowledge, essentially. When it's sort of uh, cutting edge science and the current frontier, then Wikipedia doesn't work, like if with you know, edit wars, and there's no, there's no real uh, uh, mechanism for that. So it's all about inventing that mechanism. And I think you know, a, a kind of simple idea for a direction would be you know, we rate uh, claims that are out there. And then we combine these ratings. And we also have information about the people who are performing these ratings. And some of them are going to be more reliable than others. And um, that's going to be taken into account when algorithms combine these, these ratings. Thank you very much, Nico, again. And just wanted to tell you that Nico, Nico is himself, I think, pioneering you know, this open, public, open for publishing of peer review, so open evaluation. So if you would like to give some tips, you know, like, you know, what are the dangers of it? When do you do? How you, how you actually go around doing this? So please grab some during the coffee break. It's really fantastic to give you some advice. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Martha. Thank you.